night of September 10th, 1985, was Drew Thornton's last night as a pilot, as a drug smuggler, and certainly as a skydiver. It was simply his last night. Earlier that day in Columbia, South America, someone watched as he closed the door of his Cessna 404 twin and departed for the Knoxville, Tennessee area. And though there are some who have concluded that Thornton was alone that night, about five years after Thornton jumped to his death, a Lexington man came forward with a convincing story featured in an area newspaper that he was on the plane as an unknowing accomplice. If his story is true, he would be the last person to see Drew Thornton alive. Drew Thornton made it to Knoxville that night and then died alone in the dark in the driveway of an elderly man who found Thornton's body the next morning. That gentleman was Fred Myers, and after matching what he saw outside with the noise that had awakened him earlier, he called the Knoxville police. What they found attached to Thornton's body kicked off an intense investigation into the life and death of a former soldier, lawyer, narcotics cop, and Lexington Blue Blood. This is episode four of Fly By Night, the death of pilot Drew Thornton. In the first three episodes, we met the cast of characters of the company a drug smuggling organization made up of former Lexington, Kentucky narcotics cops and others they had recruited into what became a large-scale marijuana and cocaine smuggling ring, using airplanes to fly drugs from South America to Kentucky. Their business venture had started small, apparently was selling confiscated drugs, less for the money than the thrill of it. But it wasn't long before Lexington police officer Drew Thornton began to use his pilot's license to move larger amounts of drugs into the city. By the time he died, the company had gone through several phases. And in 1985, Thornton was now operating on his own, having abandoned his partnership with Bradley Bryant and Henry Vance. And he had transitioned from flying tons of marijuana and surplus World War II cargo planes like DC-3s and DC-4s to bringing in smaller, but much more lucrative bundles of cocaine and a far less noticeable Cessna Titan, a relatively small and fast twin-engine airplane outfitted with long-range tanks. In an earlier episode, you met Rick Sanders, who was serving as a DEA agent and pilot in Kentucky at the time Thornton jumped to his death. Sanders remembers how the story of Drew Thornton began to draw wider attention when news of the fatal jump began to spread. I recall uh, hearing that there had been a uh, subject parachute to his death in Knoxville. And it was shortly thereafter that Drew Thornton's name started coming up. And then I learned that he was the guy that actually had uh, parachuted to his death. And then I subsequently learned that he was flying a Cessna 404, thought he was being uh, tailed by U.S. Customs or DEA, and that he then put the aircraft on autopilot which crashed in the mountains, in the Smoky Mountains, I believe. And uh, prior to jumping, he was throwing out duffel bags full of cocaine. And uh, I had heard that some of the coke had been been, uh, retrieved and other uh, cocaine was missing. Some, it was alleged that bears had eaten it and, and that sort of thing. But it was quite the story there at the time. As Drew Thornton flew towards his destination of Knoxville that early fall evening, With him was a man who says Thornton tricked him into coming along on what was supposed to be a simple business trip. When the plane was passing over Florida and Georgia, Thornton's companion says that Thornton became fearful that they were being chased by other aircraft, and that at the end of the flight, he, who had never jumped before, survived his leap into the dark night, while Thornton, an experienced skydiver, did not. We'll return to that story and the evidence supporting it later. But for now, it's important to know that one of several things could have caused Thornton to leap from the Cessna that night. It is possible that Thornton thought he was being tailed by another aircraft, and that he needed to stuff as much coke as he could into a duffel bag he would take with him when he jumped. Before the jump, he and his companion would throw the rest of the bundles of cocaine out over the unpopulated and mountainous forests south of the city. Days and even weeks later, Bundles of coke begin to show up in the National Forest to the south of Tennessee. Coke wrapped and labeled the same way as that found on Thornton's body. Maybe it was a case of simple paranoia, 
and there was no plane tracking the Cessna that night. It wasn't long before a DE agent was quoted in Lexington area news media, saying they had no record of any such surveillance on Thornton's plane on the night he died. And there is another theory, that Thornton was staging a crash so that he could claim the coke was lost when the Cessna went down, but that luckily he had saved what he could jump with. That would leave him responsible for paying his suppliers only for what he had managed to save, not the whole load. Then he and his ground crew would locate the coke that had been jettisoned and sell it too. Though such a scheme would have brought Thornton millions of dollars, it would have been an incredibly dangerous game to play, stealing from his Colombian suppliers, people not known for taking such a double cross lightly. What is known for certain is that there were hundreds of pounds of coke dumped along the route as far south as northern Georgia, including bundles that fell into a national forest, where a very unfortunate black bear came upon some of the cocaine and tore into an estimated 40 packets. The 175-pound bear was found dead next to the remainder of the powder and its torn wrappings. At the end of this episode, we'll update you on what happened to the bear and its odd trip to the bluegrass state where it resides today. For whatever reason, Thornton's plan began to fall apart, and he and his companion dumped most of the coke while the plane was flying on autopilot. There is substantial evidence that Thornton had two or more accomplices on the ground awaiting a possible landing and offloading at an airport in Georgia, or at a second drop zone location that was to be used if a landing wasn't possible. But Thornton's accomplices on the ground never saw millions of dollars of coke that night, either at the Georgia airport or at the backup location where they searched for the parachute canopies that would help them find treasure that had fallen from the sky. So over the years, it's understandable that members of law enforcement and followers of Thornton's story have developed competing theories as to Thornton's plan on that night. But even within a few weeks after Thornton's fatal leap, the FBI had interviewed a man who provided a detailed story of what he said had really occurred that night, a man who was a member of Thornton's three-person ground crew. It was a story backed up with airline ticket receipts, and as if the story couldn't become any stranger, one of those men would die in a crash along with many others just weeks after Thornton's death. More when Fly By Night returns. On the night of September 10, 1985, the night before Fred Myers found Thornton's lifeless body in his driveway, three men were in position at an airstrip in Jenkinsville, Georgia, where they expected Thornton to land with cocaine worth millions of dollars. One of the men was assigned to be the lone ground transporter of the coke and remained separate from the others and has never been identified. The other two men were David Cowboy Williams, an experienced skydiver who worked as an Atlanta real estate developer, and Reuben Soto, a former Marine who had met both Thornton and Williams at a skydiving event in DeLand, Florida, several years earlier. In early October of 1985, barely a month after Thornton's death, Special agents of the FBI interviewed Reuben Soto at his home in New York City. In his own written statement, Soto provides a detailed timeline of his involvement and that of Cowboy Williams on the day and night of Thornton's flight and how they found out about his death. What you'll hear next is Soto's statement as read by someone else. It has been edited somewhat for length and to remove his mention of his personal address at that time. I met Drew Thornton and David Williams at the Easter Boogie at DeLand, Florida, during the spring of 1982 or 1983. Thornton and I became friends, mostly due to my military experience. I'm airborne qualified due to my involvement with the United States Marine Corps. Thornton told me he was interested in using me on drop zone crews due to my knowledge of military night infiltration. On one occasion, Thornton asked me to go to New Orleans and help with the drop zone. The deal was called off, but Thornton allowed me to keep $500 as a retainer. Thornton kept in touch with me and helped me out in some tough financial situations. I felt indebted to Thornton. Thornton called me and told me he'd pay me $10,000 to fly to Atlanta, Georgia and participate in a drop zone operation. On September 8, 1985, Thornton called me and told me to fly down to Atlanta, Georgia on Tuesday, September 10, 1985, 
and that David Williams would meet me at the airport. David Williams picked me up at the airport in his Mercedes with the license plate Skydive. We talked about the drops which were supposed to be made the evening of September 10th, 1985, at around dusk. The plan called for Drew Thornton to fly from Columbia, South America with loads of cocaine and land at West Wind Parachute Club in Butts County, Georgia and unload the cocaine. From there, the cocaine was to be loaded into a vehicle and driven to a predetermined location. I do not know where this location was. I was hired to provide security for the drop by examining exit routes and to follow with David Williams in Williams' red blazer, the vehicle carrying the cocaine. If anyone tried to follow the vehicle carrying the cocaine, we were to interfere with it, allowing the load to go free. At about 7 p.m. on September 10, 1985, Williams and I drove the blazer down to West Wind Parachute Club to make the pickup. We got there about 7.45 p.m. There was still a plane up in the air, and there were people at the drop zone. This upset Williams. We drove to a gas station and waited for these people to leave. Williams did not want to be seen. At about 8.45 p.m., we drove to the drop zone. We waited for the plane. At about 9 p.m., Williams decided to drive to the secondary drop zone, which was in northern Georgia. We drove the Blazer toward Chattanooga, Tennessee, then got off the highway and drove along winding roads till we got to the secondary drop zone. This trip took about two to three hours. The drop zone was on the top of a mountain. Williams described it as an orchard. I believe it was close to the Tennessee border. The plan was for the second man in the plane to jump with the cocaine and to use cargo chutes for the rest. Okay, let's pause here for a minute. What you just heard in Ruben Soto's own words was that there was to be a second man in the plane. And though he didn't see that man, it's obvious he had been told that Thornton was not alone. Let's return to the statement from Ruben Soto. We waited there for about 20 minutes and then drove to a small airport nearby to see if the plane landed there. This airport was marked by a light beacon and around the back of the airport, there were bulldozers. Because there was no sign of Thornton's aircraft, we drove back to the secondary drop zone at the orchard. We waited there for about 10 minutes and Williams got out of the blazer and looked at the tree line looking for canopies. Then we drove back to Atlanta and William's home. We got home when it was just starting to get light outside. Williams and I went to bed. I slept on the sofa. Early the next morning, Williams woke me up and told me to monitor his answering machine, to answer the phone if Thornton called. Williams left early in the morning dressed in a business suit. He came back to the house at around 5.30, We heard on the television news that Drew was killed by jumping. He received a phone call at this time. I don't remember him making any calls other than to find out the next flight from Atlanta to New York. We drove in the Mercedes to the Atlanta airport, and he bought a plane ticket on Delta Airlines for me. He paid for it with a credit card. I was out of money. I flew out of Atlanta at around 9 p.m. I believe that Thornton was ripping off the Colombians because I had heard that Thornton had done a similar thing once before from someone I met in DeLand, Florida. He told me that Thornton had landed a plane, unloaded the cocaine, went back up with some cocaine strapped to him, and then bailed out, allowing the plane to crash. He would claim that he was being followed and had to bail out, and the people he ripped off would assume that the authorities had the cocaine at the crash site. Soto affirmed that his statement was true and signed it. The FBI special agent who witnessed the statement noted that Soto had a tattoo with the word airborne and a parachute on his left forearm, and another of the United States Marine Corps insignia on his right forearm. Based on David Williams' phone records and credit card receipts, the FBI felt that Soto's story was plausible, and the timeline worked. The other person that could have completely supported Soto's story would have been David Cowboy Williams. But that was now impossible, because only a few weeks earlier than Soto's FBI interview, 
and only 18 days after Drew Thornton's death, Cowboy Williams died in an aircraft accident. The airplane involved was Williams' own Cessna Caravan, a plane he operated for a skydiving business. And as tragic as the loss of any individual may be, the story was far more tragic. As 16 other skydivers and the plane's pilot died on that day, September 29, 1985. The caravan failed to gain altitude on takeoff at the Jenkinsville, Georgia airport, the same airfield where Thornton was supposed to land and offload the coke just a little over two weeks earlier. Struggling to fly, and too low for the jumpers to exit, the caravan rolled left and crashed and burned off the end of the runway. No one survived. The deaths of so many people and the rumors surrounding Cowboy Williams led the FBI to become involved, and it was their search of Williams' credit card records that led them to Reuben Soto. Almost immediately, stories began to circulate that the caravan had been sabotaged to kill Williams by the Colombians who had lost millions of dollars in Thornton's failed smuggling run. It was a story that gained great currency when representatives of both the FAA and the DEA were quoted as saying the plane's fuel had been contaminated, with the contaminant being sugar poured into the caravan's fuel tank clogging the caravan's fuel filters, and cutting off enough of the flow to make it impossible to fly. At the time, though, there were law enforcement officials who doubted that even Colombian criminals known for ruthless retaliation would have killed 16 other people to get to Williams. Even so, only a few years later, notorious cartel leader Pablo Escobar ordered the successful bombing of a Colombian airliner to kill one judge. But in this case... It was later proven through chemical analysis that the fuel that was used to refuel the caravan had been contaminated by being left exposed to the elements, promoting the growth of fungus that clogged the plane's fuel filters. And even though conspiracy theories about the crash still exist today, it appears that the death of Cowboy Williams, the caravan's pilot, and 16 skydivers was simply a horrific and very tragic coincidence. And now we return to the morning of September the 11th, 1985, when Fred Myers came upon Drew Thornton's body and called the Knoxville police. When the police searched Thornton's body, he was wearing a bulletproof vest. They found that his main chute had not deployed and that his reserve chute fell to arrest his descent in time. According to articles published in 1990, Thornton had a companion on board a man who says he was asked to come along on a trip down south to be there when Thornton met some men. And that when they arrived at a location in Columbia, this unwitting accomplice suddenly realized that Thornton had tricked him into an international drug smuggling flight. The unsuspecting passenger who made this admission to a newspaper reporter for the Knoxville News Sentinel was Bill Leonard, a well-known martial arts instructor in Lexington. Leonard is quoted as saying that Thornton said, Well, I'm going over to the Bahamas to meet a couple of guys to talk about some things, and I need somebody to watch my back. I'll pay you. Instead of landing in the Bahamas, Thornton had flown to Columbia. Quoting the newspaper article, the plane landed in a swampy area and was quickly surrounded by Colombians brandishing machine guns. Leonard said that Thornton and the ground crew loaded fuel and cocaine as he watched. Again, quoting the article, Jets begin following them at the Florida border. Leonard said Thornton told him he would have to parachute. Leonard had never jumped from a plane and was frightened. When the plane was over Georgia, Thornton told Leonard to throw things out. Leonard threw out the cocaine, which upset Thornton. Leonard continued his story in the article by saying that at one point late in the flight, Thornton turned to him and said, I'm really sorry for getting you involved in this. I can see this is not your thing. According to Leonard, just after midnight and over Knoxville, Thornton told Leonard to jump, and in what one former police officer called the luckiest jump ever, Bill Leonard leapt into the more than 100-mile-per-hour wind, blowing past the open door of the Cessna Twin, and survived his first-ever jump. Thornton jumped seconds later, and did not survive. Just a few days after Thornton's body was found in Fred Meyer's driveway, a worker at the Knoxville Downtown Airport, also known as Island Airport, found a parachute stuffed behind a hangar and reported it to police. The parachute was found approximately one-half mile from the home of Fred Meyer's, 
where Thornton's body struck the ground and he died. A medical examiner determined that Thornton had landed on his back with a duffel bag filled with bundles of coke underneath him. The examiner theorized that the position of the bag injured Thornton's spine and caused his aorta to rupture, killing him within minutes of the impact. A Knoxville police officer on the scene was quoted as saying that Thornton showed little outward sign of injury, just a small amount of blood from his nose and a cut on his face. According to published articles from 1990, the following items were found on or strapped to Thornton's body. 70 pounds of cocaine. Several weapons, including knives. Night vision goggles. South African gold coins. An address book. Several pieces of paper with cryptic sayings, such as, Believe nothing, because a wise man says it. And according to multiple news reports of that day and the days that followed, Drew Thornton was wearing expensive Italian loafers. Far from the jump boots he wore as an army paratrooper and civilian skydiver. Not exactly what you'd expect if he had been planning to jump from his Cessna Titan that night. The dumping of the cocaine in one area claimed an unusual victim a 175-pound black bear that came across bundles and ripped them open, ingesting a fatal dose of the white powder. After being discovered, the bear was stuffed and began a strange trip around the country, ending up with a collector, and later with the country music star Waylon Jennings, before being purchased in an estate sale. It now resides in a gift shop called Kentucky for Kentucky in Lexington, and has been dubbed Pablo Escobar. You can see a photo of the bear in the episode notes for episode four on our website, flybynightpodcast.com. One of the last legal acts involving Drew Thornton was the reading of his will, a will in which he made bequests to friends and associates, and he made one final request. Drew Thornton asked for one more flight. In his own words, he asked someone, quote, to release my ashes and air over my parents' farm and then have a party. That was a wish to be denied by his father, Andrew Carter Thornton II. When one of his few comments about the strange tale of the last years of his son's life said, I don't think it's anybody's business where his ashes are. He's dead. He's gone. He did wrong and he paid the price for it. I don't think anything further needs to be said. An update on the tale of Drew Thornton and his co-conspirators. In March of 2020, within a few days of each other, two of the original members of the company died. They were Henry Vance, who, as you heard in Episode 3, was convicted for his role in the murder of Florida State Attorney Eugene Berry. The other death was that of Bill Cannot, a former narcotics detective in the Lexington Police Department and long rumored to have been involved in the disappearance of Melanie Flynn. With their deaths, most of the key figures in the smuggling ring are now gone. But the story lives on, and there's now talk of a feature film being made. For their help in telling the story of Drew Thornton and his partners, thanks to retired Special Agent Jim Huggins and retired DEA agents Kelly Snyder and Rick Sanders. And a special thanks to another retired agent from the FBI, Jerry Williams, who provided a key introduction that helped in the telling of this story. Jerry Williams hosts her own podcast, Retired FBI Case File Review. Check it out. Coming up on the next episode, the hard-to-believe but very real story of an amazing landing of a DC-4 full of pot on an extremely short and rough runway on the side of a mountain in Georgia, and how the airplane was flown out of that crude airstrip to become a star in one of the worst films ever made. Fly by Night is brought to you by Midnight Flyer Media. Theme music is Darker by Henrik Anderson with additional music by Ave Stites. Show art is by Aini with additional design by Ave Stites. The show is produced and hosted by Charles Stites with editing by Ave Stites and additional audio support by Resonate Recordings. If you like what you hear, please leave a rating and a review and subscribe to Fly by Night wherever you get your podcasts. For photos and more on the key players in each episode, visit flybynightpodcast.com.